And let me know when you'd like us to get started. I see people are still entering the chat room, so I'll give it just a moment for that. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, welcome to this ABA uh, teleforum on regulatory cost benefit analysis. Um, my name is Naomi Rao. I am a judge on the DC circuit, and it's my pleasure to, to moderate this discussion. Um, thanks to the ABA for, for sponsoring this. Um, so I'm gonna just say a few words before, um, before turning it over to our expert panel. So, so regulatory reform efforts and cost benefit analysis sometimes seem, you know, kind of wonky and in the weeds, you know, something that's just for technocrats and bureaucrats to work through. And so I wanted to say a little bit um, just about the big picture. Um, regulation at the federal and state level um, have expanded to reach nearly every area of economic and social life. Federal regulation in particular has crowded out state and local regulatory solutions that might possibly be less intrusive. Um, agencies, especially at the federal level, um, are continuing to regulate at great speed, you know, adding to the overall um, mass of regulatory burdens. Many of these regulations are duplicative and some are certainly ineffective for their intended purposes. And so regulation that is unnecessary or regulation that is not well designed imposes real costs. It discourages innovation and business development. It can undermine individual responsibility. And the costs of regulation are often borne disproportionately by ordinary Americans who pay in the form of higher costs for various goods and services, um, who suffer from the contraction of economic opportunity. And so the administrative state can um, interfere with individual liberty, often with little or no improvement to the public's health, safety, or welfare. And, and given these realities, regulatory reform is, is essential. And this has been a bipartisan idea that's been recognized for many years. Going back to President Carter and President Reagan, um, when they created OIRA, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which I had the good fortune of being administrator of um, uh, some years ago. Um, you know, the idea behind OIRA is to really get a handle on what significant regulations were being promulgated across the federal government. Um, OIRA is designed to provide political control over the regulatory process. And um, in part, it also ensures regulations meet rigorous standards and OIRA works to reduce regulatory burdens. Um, in particular, you know, as I said, many of these ideas are bipartisan. Um, President Clinton's executive order 12866 set forth many of the principles that still resonate today. Perhaps chief amongst those ideas is that before the government acts, it should ask a fundamental question whether the problem at hand is one that is susceptible to a government solution. You know, should the government even be acting in a particular area? area? That in many ways is, is the first question. And if the government must act, <clears throat> then it should only adopt regulatory policies for which the benefits substantially outweigh the costs. I mean, in many ways, this is incredibly basic, and it's it's an idea that's been behind OIRA um, for many decades now. You know, I mean, there's sort of a, a fundamental question, you know, why would the government ever act to impose costs on the American people without the expectation that there would be even greater benefits? And so the fundamental principle at OIRA is to take private ordering as the baseline, you know, individuals, businesses, communities making their own decisions, and then allowing regulation only when there are substantial benefits that outweigh costs that are imposed on all Americans. Now, of course, how agencies should do this, the methods they employ, the process for reviewing regulations, you know, these are all very much contested, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that from, from our panelists. And, and let me also just say that as a judge on the DC Circuit, my role in reviewing regulatory challenges concerns the law. My cases involve questions about whether agencies have acted within their statutory mandates and limits, or whether their actions are arbitrary and capricious. And, um, and these legal assessments are quite different from the subject of this panel. Today's discussion 
is really more about the discretion of regulatory agencies at the state and federal level. And we'll be talking about how government agencies should do their work, how they assess whether a regulation is worth enacting and in, and in what form. And so given my previous experience as the OIR administrator, I'm very pleased um, to moderate this panel of regulatory experts who are, are still very much in the regulatory trenches. So um, let me just briefly introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking. So first we'll hear from Andrew Wheeler, who is the director of the, of the new Virginia Office of Regulatory Management. He's also the former administrator of the EPA, a role in which we work together on a number of reforms. Um, second, we'll hear from Reeve Bull, who is deputy director um, to, to Andrew Wheeler in that same office. Reeve for many years also helped to lead the Administrative Conference of the United States, um, better known as ACUS. Um, third, we have Anthony Campo, who is Director of Government Regulation and Counsel at Clark Hill. Anthony served with me at OIRA and did, did a lot of great work on, on regulatory reform. And finally, we'll hear from Stuart Shapiro, who is Dean and Professor at the Rutgers School of Planning and Public Policy. He was also a former OIRA desk officer and so, so also has a lot of real life experience on these issues. So the way it's going to work today is they each of our panelists will give a few introductory remarks and then we'll have a moderated discussion. If you have questions for the panel, please send them um, through the Q&A feature or through the webinar chat and I'll try to work them into the discussion. So with that, um, Director Wheeler, if you'd like to, to kick us off. Thank you, Judge Rao, and thank you for convening the panel today. It's an honor to be here. Um, as the judge said, my title is Deputy, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not Deputy, Director of Regulatory Management for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And that's, I have the distinction of being the very first Director of Regulatory Management. It's a newly created office. Um, in Virginia government, the uh, governor, first of all, is terminated to four years, but in the first six months must issue an executive order um, explaining how they're going to manage the regulatory process during their term. And that deadline is, is July 1st of their of their first year. When Governor Yunkin became governor last year, he discovered a few things. First of all, um, the fact that regulations took on average 264 days to clear the governor's office. And that is not, obviously, and that was in the first few months that he discovered that. So that is not the, the average in our administration, that is over the last 10 to 15 years, the average was 264 days. Second was that over half of the regulations actually bypassed the governor's office and the cabinet. They went straight to our registrar for, for printing. Um, so he, he looked at that and he was, he was very concerned. On his first day, he issued an executive order requiring a 25% reduction in regulations. Over the next six months, while he prepared his executive order, which ended up creating our office, he looked at the regulatory process. He looked at the fact that the regulations were bypassing um, the office of the governor, that the average time was so long, and he wanted to put in place transparency and efficiency across the entire regulatory process. So he created the Office of Regulatory Management. We review every regulation that goes through the state, that that goes through the state, as well as all guidance documents. He also changed the 25% reduction to a 25% reduction in regulatory requirements. So again, originally his executive order was a 25% reduction in regulations. He refined that to be a 25% reduction in regulatory requirements. Each regulation can have multiple requirements. And the idea is to take a look, a hard look at the regulations as well as the guidance documents because the reduction level applies to both and make a 25% reduction. The 25% reduction in regulations didn't make sense because for example, one agency only had one regulation. They just kept each year adding additional subparts to their regulation. So in order to be um, more effective, he, he focused on the number of regulatory requirements. I believe we are the first state to ever require regulatory reductions um, from guidance documents as well as regulations. 
as well as requiring cost impact analysis for both. So our office reviews the regulations and guidance documents. We take a look at the cost impact analysis. Cost impact analysis requires an examination of the impacts, um, one on cost benefit, as well as the impacts on um, small businesses, local governments, families, um, across the board. So what we also discovered was that our agencies, unlike the federal government, for the most part, don't have economists on staff. So we had to come up with a process um, to, to help our agencies without economists um, be able to analyze the cost impact analysis, the regulations and guidance documents in a, in a thoughtful manner. And with that, uh, my, my deputy, Reeve Bull, produced two manuals. First, a how-to guide on how to conduct cost impact analysis for basically the non-economists, as well as a how-to guide on how, to, how do you count and account for regulatory requirements. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my deputy and have him talk more about both of the manuals, which I believe are, are very groundbreaking for state government. Wonderful. So uh, thanks, Director Wheeler. Uh, and so what I would like to do is, um, as, as Director Wheeler mentioned, uh, discuss these two uh, major resources that are part part and parcel of Governor Yunkin's overall uh, Executive Order 19 um, regulatory modernization process and sort of elaborate on, on what each of them is and what it does and sort of how it ties into the process. Um, and I think an important uh, a way to look at it would be that um, the executive order and the process that we've designed here at ORM looks both uh, prospectively at new regulations that agencies are adopting, uh, as well as retrospectively at the regulations that they currently have on the books. Uh, we think that's critical in order to consider all of the regulations, uh, both existing and new regulations, um, in each of those resources ties in to um, each of those separate processes. Um, so the first resource that Director Wheeler mentioned was our regulatory economic analysis guide. Um, and that deals with prospective regulations, new regulations. Um, and the guide you can think of is sort of like the Virginia equivalent of OMB Circular A4. Um, and we uh, actually modeled the guide, at least partly on the, the original, not the revised, but the original uh, circular A4 at OMB, uh, as well as a couple of state equivalents, uh, Rhode Island, Colorado, um, I think were the major ones. Interestingly, virtually no state um, has anything like this. So uh, with a couple of exceptions, this is actually the first time a state um, has ever put out a resource um, like this. Um, and what we tried to do, as is, is Director Wheeler mentioned, is really gear it for non-economists um, at agencies, unlike at the federal level where most agencies do have economists. And of course, OIRA has economists on staff. Um, it's very, very rare that Virginia agencies would have economists. Um, but for the, for the discussions that we've had, you know, with experts in the field, most agency officials at least have a master's of public administration where they have taken at least some economic courses. Um, and so uh, we designed the guide with that audience uh, in mind. Um, and we found so far that it's been very, very effective. Um, we've really distilled it down to basically the, the four key questions that you want to ask as part of a regulatory economic analysis. Uh, what's the underlying problem that you're trying to solve? Uh, what are the alternative approaches to assessing that problem? What are the benefits and costs? Then ideally you would try to monetize, put a dollar value to those benefits and costs. Um, and then finally, there are some targeted analyses looking at effects on local governments, families, and, and small businesses. Um, and what agencies do is for every single regulation and every single guidance document that they now issue, um, using that manual, using the resources we provided, uh, they prepare a regulatory economic analysis. And they fill out a form, um, and that goes up on our Virginia Reg Regulatory Town Hall website. Um, and those forms uh, are actually very, very short, very, very straightforward. They tend to be around eight to 10 pages on average. 
um, much, much shorter than like federal regulatory uh, impact analyses by, by contrast. And I think that's partly because it's, you know, designed for, for, for non economists. But from what we found, they've done a, a pretty good job of, um, of, you know, assessing the benefits and the cost. And we've really seen some improvement in the, uh, the quality of the economic analysis over time. So um, it really seems to be working and has had some, you know, we've had some major successes uh, in terms of agencies really drilling in to the economic effects of the regulations. Um, so that's the process for new regulations. I'll just briefly cover the process for existing regulations. Um, so even before we came into office, agencies were required under the Virginia uh, APA, we call it the Administrative Process Act in Virginia, but they were required every four years to do what's called a periodic review. Uh, where they review every single regulation they have on the books uh, and decide if it's still needed. Um, now, as Director Wheeler mentioned, uh, Governor Youngkin's Executive Order 19 supplements that by providing that we are looking for a 25% reduction in regulatory requirements um, over the course of the administration. Uh, and it was actually based on a, a pilot program that was done back in 2018. It was passed unanimously uh, by the, the Virginia General Assembly. Um, and that pilot program uh, asked agencies to catalog the number of requirements they had on the books. Uh, and then two agencies, the Department of Criminal Justice Services and DPOR, the Department of Professional and Occupational Regulation, were tasked with doing a 25% reduction. So what we've done is we've rolled that out to the entire Virginia state government. Um, and this guide, like the Regulatory Economic Analysis Guide, provides guidance on how that's done. And we found that that's been very, very helpful. There were certainly, the first time it was done, some inconsistencies in terms of sort of how agencies approach counting requirements and what's included as a requirement. Um, and the guide is intended to um, provide a framework, a unified framework uh, for, for, for doing this exercise and provide clear guidance to agencies. And we think a couple of aspects of it are unique. Um, one of which is we give them credit, not just for eliminating musts and shalls, um, but also for reducing the costs uh, of, of requirements. So one example is our board for barbers and cosmetology reduced training hours from 1,500 to 1,000. Of course, they're not getting rid of the requirement, but they are reducing its stringency. And so we give them credit for that. That's a 33% reduction of that particular uh, regulation. Uh, and then as Director Wheeler mentioned, it also covers guidance documents. Guidance documents, of course, shouldn't uh, include requirements, although if we do, we require agencies to tabulate those. Um, but we're also looking to reduce the length of guidance documents by 25% to make it easier and more streamlined for the public. Um, so that's the overall process. Um, our hope is that it becomes a model for other states. Um, a lot of states have very, very similar processes, and we feel that they could easily pick up our regulatory economic analysis guide or our regulatory reduction guide um, and implement something similar. Uh, so that's our hope, and that's something we'd like to explore uh, on today's panel. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Reeve. Um, Anthony, would you like to jump in? Sure. Thank you, Judge Rao. Thanks to the ABA section for hosting this discussion uh, and for uh, uh, Judge Rao and fellow panelists to, to be here to discuss this uh, important topic. It's uh, very exciting. And I congratulate uh, the governor and Director Wheeler and Reeve for your uh, incredible work uh, on this front. You guys have really, um, you've really done uh, something extraordinary. The guides, I really uh, commend those to, um, to the section members listening. It's a, they're really uh, excellent. Um, especially as you know, you know, many of you are sort of you've you've gone into the um, to look at the proposed you know changes to A4 at the federal level um, to kind of uh, look at what Virginia has done, what they've laid out in this space. I think is very compelling. It's very good um, and sort of consistent with the kind of um, uh, decades long practice that's sort of stood the test of time at the federal level across uh, administrations of very different philosophical persuasions. Um, and I think uh, I think that's very good to kind of take take move in that direction. So great great work there. Um, and something, Reeve, I guess that you said that I want to uh, to emphasize uh, in in Virginia, and I think it's true at the federal level as well. But you you mentioned that the this began with a pilot program that passed the General Assembly unanimously. Um, and I think under even the previous administration, there was some work on this front. So a lot of this is it really is um, bipartisan or nonpartisan. Um, really trying to to uh, sort of 
have uh, transparency around analysis and effects of uh, regulatory actions and making sure that we have a, a you know sort of rational uh, regulatory framework um, that protects health and safety, um, but isn't overly burdensome uh, with unnecessary restrictions that um, that make it too difficult to, uh, to to operate in the world here. So so great work uh, to to your team. Um, I might just talk for a minute about uh, a couple minutes about what we did at the federal level um, beforehand, and then look forward to the discussion a little bit. And and Stuart uh, correcting me uh, <laughs> in just a, in just a few minutes. Um, but uh, I just say sort of backing up to um, before we we uh, we we got to OIRA, um, you know, from the year two thousand to twenty sixteen, so spanning a couple different administrations, we saw that the annual trend at the federal level, Council of Economic Advisors said, was for regulatory costs to grow by eight point two billion dollars a year. Of course, some analysts measure the t the cumulative regulatory burden in the trillions of dollars. Uh, even exceeding the amount of uh, tax revenues collected in any given year. So just an extraordinary impact. Um, and we know that small businesses uh, have regularly reported uh, cumulative regulatory burdens as their number one uh, business concern. Um, so really um, an issue that touches down for, um, for, uh, for, for a lot of folks in a very real way. Um, in uh, in in our old office's records, what one of the things that we saw was um, in uh, 2017 um, that that trend for regulatory costs that you know was growing, growing, growing billions of dollars a year. Um, in 2017, sort of went down through the x-axis into negative territory, um, and uh, by the end of the first uh, 21 months, we had saved on net 33 billion dollars in regulatory costs as uh, contrasted with the prior administration which had imposed on net 245 billion dollars in regulatory costs so a 278 billion dollar difference in approach there um which is pretty pretty dramatic and i think that um part of the way th there were a number of things that we did to get there um and uh um uh we will get into i think in the regulatory budget side is, is obviously a key aspect there but other um features were uh, more transparency on regulations under development we improved the guidance practices uh, of the executive branch um, we provided more opportunities for public engagement in the rulemaking and guidance processes um uh, we tried to continue to emphasize retrospective review, um, and uh, and despite what maybe uh, some others might say, we we really tried to focus on cost benefit analysis um, and integrating that into the budget. And that's another thing that I think that um, you all have done in Virginia, which is really excellent. Is not is this is not um, I, I gather, and you correct me if this if, if if I'm misunderstanding it, but what I see is you you guys really emphasizing the importance of analysis. And the importance of the regulatory budget together, putting those two pieces together, and I think that that is really important. Um, at the federal level, it was maybe um, a little bit um, less um, obvious because the attention was on this sort of two for one executive order. But what the implementing architecture for that did was it said follow twelve eight six six, follow the long standing practices with respect to analysis. Um, and make sure it's an integral part of of the implementation of the regulatory budget. So, so we really tried to do that at the federal level. I think they'll we'll be more explicit about that. I expect in the future. And I just think what Virginia has done in that respect is is really great. Um, and um, and we also try to uh, uh, emphasize that uh, regulatory policy needs to be anchored in the best available public facing information. So you put all that together, um, and you get a set of kind of. Uh, uh, practices that are anchored in many respects in uh, a lot of um, uh, the work of this section in the past, uh, ACUS work in the past. Um, uh, I've mentioned this in other contexts, but I mean, the World Bank, OECD, the US government regularly champions these kind of principles and values around the world. Um, and, uh, and we really uh, sort of took those to heart and tried to um, promote them. Um, and um, and uh, and integrate them with the regulatory budget, um, so that we could have a um, a responsible um, um, regulatory uh, architecture that that like as I say protects health and safety, and also make sure that we're not um, going too far and we're allowing kind of um, the market market to operate as well. So maybe I'll just leave it there, and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Great, thanks, Anthony. Um, Stuart, I guess you get to, to back clean up to all of that. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Judge Rao. Thanks to Reeve for organizing and to the ABA for, for hosting the panel.
Um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about when regulatory reforms last, um, the durability of regulatory reforms. Um, and in particular, I'm talking about reforms to the regulatory process like those um, that Director Wheeler and Reeve were talking about when they talked about the uh, the new review process at the Office of Regulatory Management and the requirements for analysis. I'm talking a little bit less about the 25% reduction because that is very much sort of contained um, in the present time there. Um, and it's uh, durability is important because I think for regulatory process reforms to have an impact, they have to stay in place beyond the administration that issues it. Um, the appointment process now, particularly at the federal level and its evolution over the past half century, has really ensured a pretty good mechanism for presidents to ensure that their priorities are followed during their administration. But regulatory reforms really are to some degree about legacies and impacting future administrations. Now, one way to do that, of course, is to embed those reforms in statutes. Um, there was a time at the federal level and a couple of the speakers have referred to this, where this happened fairly regularly, the Paperwork Reduction Act and the Regulatory Flexibility Act in the late 1970s, and then again, the Unfunded Mandates Act and, uh, and, and Sabrifa in the mid-1990s um, were both bipartisan, both occurred with uh, the first occurred with a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president, the second with a Republican Congress and a Democratic Congress. Those kinds of reforms statute uh, embedded in statutes don't really happen anymore. And it's been really since 1995, I'd argue, since we've seen anything uh, meaningful like that. Um, it does happen sometimes at the state level, um, but usually where there's more uniform uh, party control control of the legislature and governor's office. Um, there are a number of states that have legislative review of regulations um, in, uh, in statute and others that have analytical requirements there as well. So when does a reform that comes from the executive um, stay in place when the governor or the president leaves office, and particularly when there's a change in party? Um, well, as uh, has been noted, we have, do have an excellent example at the federal level. Executive Order 12291 was issued by President Reagan in 1991, uh, 1981, sorry, um, and, uh, and then modified, but largely uh, left in place by President Clinton in 1993. Um, and like uh, the work going on in Virginia, it required office review by an office reporting to the to the executive, OIRA in this case, um, and requirements for, for regulatory impact analysis of a number of, uh, or a subset at least, of regulations. And while there have been additions and modifications to 12866 since the Clinton administration, no one has altered the fundamental underlying structure, despite the fact that we have had now presidents with very different attitudes regarding uh, regulation. Um, I'd argue that there are four things that have helped 12866 endure um, over the years. Um, the first is it makes the executive stronger. Um, presidents and governors understandably like regulatory reforms that help them influence or at least keep an eye on regulatory decisions that they will inevitably be blamed for or given credit for. Um, 12866 does this by giving OIRA that regulatory review power and OIRA regularly shares um, drafts of regulations with the White House and the offices therein. Um, by coupling the rest of the requirements of 12866, particularly the cost benefit requirements with OIRA review, Presidents Reagan and Clinton made it attractive to future presidents. And of course, um, now Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan talked about this a fair amount in her seminal article on presidential administration. Um, a second factor is the neutral veneer of cost benefit analysis. And I'll make clear that I am a big fan of cost benefit analysis. And I think part of the reason I feel that way is that at heart, it's the very so there's a very solid principle for policymaking, and that is that we should understand the consequences of our actions and government's actions before they are taken. Um, you add in the transparency, or I should say the potential 
transparency benefit of cost benefit analysis because it's not always realized um, in that it forces agencies to make clear both to the public and to the executive um, what the consequences of their proposed regulatory actions are. Um, now, there are some on both sides of the ideological divide that don't like cost-benefit analysis on the left. Some are concerned that it is inherently biased against government. And on the right, uh, there are those who argue that analyses conducted by agencies will inevitably be biased in favor of the actions that agencies want to take. And not that either of these arguments are completely without truth, but I don't think there's enough there to um, that really has damaged the way cost-benefit analysis is viewed by many of us um, in, uh, in, in the regulatory space. Um, a third factor related to, to that is the language used to describe the actions. Um, Sally Katzen, who is uh, essentially the principal author of 12866 and the head of OIRA under President Clinton, always talked about the executive order requirements as being common sense, good policy making. Um, and I was impressed by the materials surrounding the Virginia order, which talked about how regulation was essential and that transparency was important. Principles like this are easy to get long-term and widespread support for. Um, deregulation, redistribution, those are principles that are more hotly contested, um, both I think by policy elites and, and, and by a more general um, group of people. And so these orders that have lasted and 12866 in particular has been cast differently um, than, uh, than, than, than uh, some others that didn't last. And fourth, and this is gonna sound a little bit odd, but I think it's uh, as important as the other three is the action has wiggle room. Um, the key change from the Reagan order to the Clinton order was the change from uh, saying that uh, benefits had to exceed costs to benefits had to justify costs. Now, in point of fact, benefits exceeding cost, I think, has far more wiggle room than people generally gave it credit for um, because of the nature of economics and the nature of benefit cost analysis. But I don't think there's any that would argue that benefits justifying costs has more wiggle room. Um, and this is important because at the end of the day, executives, regardless of their substantive preferences, are going to have a host of reasons for wanting to issue regulations or policy in general. And they don't want their own executive orders with very hardline language to stand in the way of their doing that. Um, when John Graham, who was George W. Bush's uh, first head of OIRA, came into office, he faced the decision of whether or not to keep 12866 in place. And he said, both within OIRA and publicly, that 12866 contained everything he needed to, con uh, to put forward the Bush administration's regulatory goals. And I think the way it is written was important towards him reaching that decision and his successors um, largely doing so as well. Um, as states consider executive regulatory reforms like the one that Virginia has, um, I think they should probably keep these qualities in mind. Now, I want to be careful, of course. I don't want to say that any of these provide a guarantee that they will last or are always necessary. I was very surprised this year, actually, to see the Biden administration discard the uh, change the Trump administration had made regarding IR, uh, OIRA review of IRS regulations, which was something I actually thought they would keep. Um, and it was not something that they got rid of right away, but they did earlier this year. And that was a surprise to me because that reform hits most of the, uh, the points I just made. Um, then uh, on the other side, um, states with a very stable political climate um, where one party has controlled the governor and the legislature for a long time, um, you do tend to see uh, the work of the previous governor kept in place. And so you don't need to meet all these requirements in those political climates. Um, I'm happy to talk more about the Biden reforms to Circular A4 and to the, the particulars of Virginia, but I think it's probably best to leave that for the discussion and for Q&A. And so I will turn it back to you, Judge Rao. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Stuart, for those observations. Um, maybe I'll begin with a question just picking up on, on some of the things that you mentioned, Stuart. Um, 
and also relating to to what the other panelists have have spoken about, I, I think this idea of of what is durable in regulatory reform and regulatory process is a very interesting question because so much of it is a create is like a creature of executive process, right? Whether it's a governor or a president, and so you know any subsequent governor or president can simply just make a different choice. But in many areas, as you point out, they haven't. You know, we also looked at. 12866 and you know decided it was prudent and best to keep that in place for for many of the reasons that you mentioned but um so durability and stability is important but but what role and this is a question really for all the panels like what role does presidential control or governor control you know political control play in the regulatory process because often one of the justifications for um in a sort of the constitutionality or the legitimacy of the administrative state is that it's politically accountable. And that political accountability largely comes through an elected official. So, so I'm curious how you think, um, you know, questions of durability intersect with, with the importance of political control or with political control, whether you think it's important or not, I guess. Uh, Judge Rao, do you mind if I jump in? Yeah, sure. So, First of all, in 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 creating our um, reduction goal of twenty five percent in regulatory requirements, we built off of, as Reeve and I mentioned, a twenty eighteen um, law that was passed unanimously by our our at that time democratically controlled Senate and signed into law by the previous Democratic governor. Um, but you know, there's there's also the efficiency side. I mentioned that it, it took uh, two hundred sixty four days for regulation to get through. The governor's office we have that down to 12 days now so future governors if they want to change the regulatory process if they're going to make it longer and more difficult to get regulations through are going to have to justify why they would make that change now at the at the federal level something that i was absolutely shocked that the biden administration did i, I wasn't surprised that they got rid of a number of president trump's um, executive orders but they got rid of the executive order on guidance documents. And you know that required all guidance documents to be put on a searchable um, database for the public to be able to see for the first time ever. And we did that at EPA, 10,000 guidance documents you could search. And prior to that, you had to literally go to the EPA reading rooms at the EPA headquarters and search through file cabinets to look for guidance documents. The, uh, the Biden administration got rid of the executive order, but they also took down the database. So that's just absolutely, actually it's under waste, fraud and abuse. It's waste of government resources because they just dismantled a perfectly functioning um, database that provided access to the public of guidance documents. I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't seen that much of an outcry at that, at that, at that waste. But I don't I'm know. Also, I don't remember what the justification was for. I, I haven't really seen a justification on that. But if I am concerned, and this goes to what Dean Shapiro was talking about, he mentioned a a four briefly. Um, I I think the Biden administration is politicizing the OIRA process um, more so than any previous administration. You know, in the past, OIRA was calling balls and strikes as an umpire, looking at the cost um, at, at the cost impact cost benefit analysis the data coming from the agencies, um, they've put a lot of subjective criteria now into the A4. So that is going to open the door. I think a future Republican administration will probably do away with the, you know, with the Biden A4 and put their own subjective criteria in. So I think it's, it's really, a, it's a sad state for regulatory review because in the past it was much more objective and you, every administration, every OIRA um, office was operating under the same ground rules, but now they've changed the ground rules and they've made it much more um, subjective as to what the criteria that they look at. And I'm, I'm very concerned about that. I thought that um, A4 met many of the durability criteria that, that Stuart mentioned, actually, and it had been in place for a long time. Maybe, I don't know. Anthony Reeve, if you want to speak to that. I I definitely have thoughts on it. But Reeve, I don't know if you want to address it. You've I know you've obviously thought a lot on this as well. Uh you, you go first, Anthony. I'll have some yeah. thoughts as well. But... Yeah, I mean, I think that um uh absolutely, you know, I I was uh I was in a discussion, uh a different panel with uh Sally uh, uh Katz and as we mentioned earlier, and 
And she said, oh, oh, A4 is not a foundational document of the administrative state. I said, Sally, that's just because it came out after you were there. You, could, you know, ask anybody who's been there uh, in the last 20 years, and they'll tell you A4 is absolutely uh, foundational. Every single discussion between an OIRA desk officer and, a, and a, an, uh, uh, an agency drafter is all about A4. A ton of it is about A4. And so to me, it is very strange because you have OIRA desk officers who for Years and years and years, they're most of them their entire career have been arguing one approach to analysis against a different approach. And now they have to just completely flip and go to the side they've been arguing against and say, no, that's our that that's what we want. Um, that's our view now. It's it's very strange. Um, and I I am I think that um uh we took we took a pass on those reform. We wanted to reform A4 in a different direction and we didn't do it. And absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, <clears throat> I heard a, I heard um, somebody who I think worked on the previous uh, or on the current proposal of uh, speaking publicly about it said he's really excited about other changes, other, you know, things that are percolating in the academy because those will go into the next round of A4 refresh, you know, and then perhaps in the next, you know, term or the next administration, Democratic administration. And it's just sort of a sign that, okay, A4 is is open. It's an it's it's open now forever and um and twelve eight six six had never been opened. We had we supplemented it. Different people put EOs that you know amended it, uh, made additions, but no excuse but um, additions, but nobody you know went in and took stuff out of it, which is what the the, the current one has done. And I think that that is a very dangerous place. And I think twelve eight six six and A four for the foreseeable future are open. And I I I think. Both to me, both were anchored in um, in those principles that Stuart mentioned, and also I think a quality about them that is um, it's not just the it's not just the principles, but once something like that, like A four, has um, has has gone through administrations of of d different you know parties and philosophical persuasions, and has stuck around, stayed around, you know. Um, to go in and change it because there's some modest thing that we could do to it, or there's some there's something that we could you know improve on it. Uh, it's just it's just opening it's opening it up forever and and making it less likely that it will stay on on those rails. So I, I think it's I think it's very dangerous. But one thing I wanted to say about the what's happening in Virginia, um, if you take an example of their um, of the rules, what they've done, and I think this is consistent with what Stuart's saying, that is very helpful. I think for the the regulatory budget there is a little bit different, right? And you guys tell me if it's wrong, but it's it's le it's slightly less about the cost and it's more about the restrictions and the requirements. And the process for going through and identifying those is really interesting because it's sort of like a transparency-based process. And it says like, it, it, it identifies a restriction and it says, this is a, a discretionary regulatory requirement basically created by regulation. This is a statutory requirement that is fixed, right? This is a, a discretionary regulation that governs agency action. This is a statutory restriction. So it's categorizing restrictions in a way that's transparent. And I think it's really useful for the public to know, did the legislature create this? Did an agency create it? There's nothing, to me, there's nothing particularly political about saying what the origin of a restriction is. And then you go through a process to figure out where that restriction ought to land. But I think that's a really helpful um, a sort of different cut uh, at a regulatory budget from saying, you know, because part of the criticism that we had was, oh, it's all about cost and dollars. And, and, and this is sort of something, this is something slight, a slight permutation of it that I think is, I think is pretty interesting. Uh, wonderful. Yeah. So first of all, that's exactly right, Anthony, in terms of how we've um, we've structured the 25 percent, looking specifically at discretionary requirements. Um, and, and to Judge Rao's question, and, you know, and I agree with you, Anthony, in terms of I feel like the, the original circular A4, I think the reason why it stood the test of time is because it performed so well on those those metrics that, that Dean Shapiro um, had, had described. Um, and, and two things that I'd really emphasize about it, um, sort of building on Anthony's points, are first, it's, it's impartiality, that it really was focused on just the quality of the economic analysis that agencies are undertaking, didn't put its thumb on the scale on, on one, in one direction or the other. Um, and then also something that I think has has been part of the discussion, um, you know, with respect to the revised circular A4, um, though perhaps not as emphasized as the impartiality point, is just its simplicity. 
you know, is relatively straightforward. It's a relatively short document. Um, and it was something that, you know, for me, like as a non-economist, you know, I could easily pick up and understand. Um, and that's why it was so influential, at least in terms of what we were doing when we were designing. And I relied very heavily um, on Circular A4. Um, and, you know, we tried to do something similar, tried to make the process as impartial as possible. Um, you know, we don't tell agencies to reach a particular outcome. You know, we ask them to monetize the benefits, monetize the cost, and it's up to the agency ultimately, you know, what, what determination it makes, you know, based on the statutory requirements that are in place. Our goal is simply to make the process objective and impartial and ensure that agencies are relying on the best possible evidence. Um, and then secondly, um, more like the earlier version of Circular A4, we intentionally designed the process to be simple and straightforward. Um, our hope is that anybody could pick up any of these resources and easily um, understand what it is we're trying to achieve, and then ideally understand what it is the agencies are doing as well, and therefore be able to participate in the process. And I think that's also very important in terms of durability, is something that the public can understand and can buy into. Um, so those, you know, those goals were definitely sort of in our mind as we were designing this process, and our hope is that, um, you know, we'll achieve some measure of durability, both in Virginia, and then um, hopefully that will catch on in other states as well. Um, so I will uh, just add a couple of, of quick thoughts because there have been a lot of uh, good points made on, on A4 in particular. One thing I would note is that what we've seen so far is the proposed uh, revision to it. We don't know yet what the final revision will look like. And if you read through the public comments, and I commented on it, and there may have been others on this call that did, um, and... Uh, there are a lot of really uh, in-depth comments that uh, OIRA has to go through and think about as they revise it. Um, I, I will say and uh, that if the, the sort of two headline changes, the discount rate and the distributive weights um, stay in the final version of A4, then I do share Anthony's concerns that it really will appear as if uh, it's being designed to reach a particular result. I don't want to say that everything in A4 is sacred. Knowledge moves forward, and this is a document based on economic knowledge. And so I, I do think I'm probably open to seeing modifications to it, but the modifications, those two modifications in particular were significant enough that I think it raises the concerns um, that, that Anthony voiced. Um, the other thing is getting back to Judge Rao's initial question, the, the question of political control, um, I think is really important and certainly I've spent a lot of my, my academic career thinking about that. Um, and I, I do think that political control is important. I, I think um, we shouldn't ignore the fact that agencies are in general reacting to statutes that were passed by Congress. Um, and so that is a form of political control. Um, but many of those statutes for good and not so good reasons leave a lot unanswered and uh, a lot of discretion. And as those smaller choices are made, I do think political control is important. And I think it is quite logical that presidents who with each passing year, more and more become the face of all policymaking in Washington, whether or not they had something to do with it or not, have an interest in making sure those decisions go in the direction that uh, that they feel appropriate. Um, and, and so I think that is something that's not going to go away or not going to change anytime soon. I, I used to say when I was administrator that one of my jobs was to operationalize the unitary executive, but... Uh... I do think that was uh, was an important important part of the job. Certainly not the only part, but but an important part. So so I am interested in this, um, you know, the state level, like OIRAs. You know what's happening here in Virginia. I'm wondering, um, Andrew and Reeve, if you have a sense of even like a rough sense of what percentage of regulatory burdens in Virginia are imposed by state regulatory requirements and you know, or by federal requirements. I don't know if you have any sense of that. I just think that would be an interesting thing to know. Yeah, it's, I, I we haven't calculated the total um, amount from federal versus state, but it is significant. Federal requirements are very significant. Mm -hmm. And um, we do, when we make the 25% regulatory reduction, we do not require 
we don't count the federal requirements into the baseline. Mm -hmm. um, we had all of our agencies provide us a baseline of their regulatory requirements for all of their regulations, and they did not include the federal requirements. Now, one thing that we did notice um, historically is that a lot of agencies, and I, and I think this is probably true across the country, will say this regulation is required by federal government. And if you do a deep dive into it, you may find that 80% of it was required by the federal government, but that the agencies tacked on additional discretionary requirements. And we are focusing on those additional discretionary requirements. Okay. But there was a very large percentage, and it varies from agency to agency. Mm -hmm. um, some are more prescriptive. Some federal agencies are more prescriptive to the states than others, of course. Yeah. I would I would echo what Director Wheeler said. It, it, it seems like it varies a lot by area. You know, a lot of the environmental requirements, a lot of the Medicare and Medicaid, you know, tends to be driven at, at the federal level, whereas um, things like occupational licensing and, and other areas tend to be more, more state driven. Um, but certainly a lot of it is federally required. And, um, you know, that definitely sort of dictates the, the flexibility that states have. Although, as Director Wheeler mentions, you know, one thing we're trying to do is really sort of parse out what actually is required federally and what might states be adding on. And the same thing with respect to state statutes as well. Um, you know, just because a state statute uh, authorizes a program doesn't mean the agency has to act. So we're looking very, very carefully at the statutory and, and federal regulatory authorizations and then what agencies do in response. Go ahead, Anthony. I was just going to say, it's making me think of the, um, um, uh, you know, um, UMRA at the federal level is obviously, in my view, is not very well enforced. Uh, it's an important statute, Stuart mentioned earlier, passed on a bipartisan basis. There have been several legislative proposals to strengthen its uh, implementation. But I wonder if that's something, you know, uh, Director Wheeler and, and review, you all have uh, already bitten off a whole lot, but, um, uh, but, but taking a look at, you know, maybe helping to guide the federal government on improvements that could be made to UMRA, because really um, that, that's a, that there's a real linkage there probably. Um, uh, but, but like I said, you've already bitten off a whole lot. So maybe that's for, maybe that's for the next phase. One one other point is, is is the way businesses perceive regulations. At the end of the day, I don't think they care whether it comes from the feds or the states or their local government. They just know that there's a lot of stuff that they have to do. And of course, it's incumbent upon officials at all three levels to consider what's going on at the other levels and how that affects them. But the perception of regulation, I think, is uh comes not just from one level of government but from the fact that uh that that businesses feel like they they have to adhere to lots of sometimes contradictory duplicative uh etc requirements um, because they're coming from different sources uh dean shapiro i will add to that though what governor yunkin has discovered in trying to attract new businesses to virginia is that they do look at the regulatory burdens from state to state that's so that does true. play quite a bit in um, site selection across mm -hmm. the country. And then, of course, um, there's been some examples in the past of some of the more regulatory states in our in our country that push for federal regulations to mirror their regulations to level the playing field. They Instead of trying to deregulate, they're trying to bring other states up to their same level right. of regulation, whether it's necessary or not. The question oh, of race to the top or race to the bottom, depending right. on your perspective. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so I'll just, we only have about five more minutes. So I just wanted to, to see if the audience had any questions, feel free to, to put them into the chat. But, um, but another question I was wondering is how, um, you know, are there ways to get these sorts of state regulatory reforms um, pushed out to other states, either through ACUS or other means? I mean, I know when I was, administrator of OIRA, a number of state officials had come to talk to me about regulatory reforms, you know, sort of thinking about how can we do state regulatory reforms along the same model as uh, as the federal government. And I don't know how much of that actually took root, but there did seem to be a lot of interest um, from state officials. And so I was wondering if you've been working with, with people in other states um, to help implement this sort of thing. We have. We've heard from a number of other states. 
and we've shared our uh, the manuals that Reeve um, wrote for us on the cost benefit and rate reduction. And so there's been quite a bit of quite a bit of interest, um, and I, I think that's very healthy. I, I, absolutely. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, one of the things that we're hearing from states and that we think hopefully sort of sparks um, some movement on this front is that, um, you know, partly because we were sort of one of the first movers in the space, you know, that there weren't extensive resources in place, whereas we feel like now that we have these manuals available, it's the sort of thing that another state could, could pretty easily pick up. And if not adopt 100%, at least tailor it to, to their to their state program. Um, and then another thing that we're hearing is that, um, you know, there may be some concern about the resources that it requires. But you know, one thing I'll emphasize is, you know, we're a very small shop. You have basically two thirds of the uh, regulatory team, at least in ORM, on on the call today. Director Wheeler and myself. Uh, we have a third policy analyst um, that works uh, works with us as well. Um, and then, of course, the agencies have not added new staff. They're just using, you know, their existing regulatory coordinators to do this sort of analysis. Um, and we found that it's worked quite well. Um, so um, I think sort of as the states start to, to, to see that it's, you know, it's something where the reforms can be put in place in a relatively streamlined way and that it doesn't require a major investment of resources, um, hopefully more will start to, to take, take up these sorts of modernization efforts. Okay, maybe um, just as a wrap up, um, maybe if each of you could just say what you think are some of the biggest challenges facing, you know, regulatory policy right now in, in a few words. I, I would just say I, I um, really think it's important to try to be as impartial as possible as far as calculating costs, calculating benefits, and, and letting other people judge um, the results of the analysis instead of um, a heavy-handed uh, um, um, policy objective of, of, the, of the organization, whether it's federal or state. I, I think we need to have more data out there that people can then make the, draw their own conclusions, and which is what we're trying to do uh, at the state level and what I'm afraid um, the A4 changes are not doing is we, we really have to have um, use common definitions. And I did that at EPA with our cost benefit rule where we try to define the terms because you can you, there's too much um, play around what the different terms mean. I think if you have common definitions, then we'll have a better understanding and more transparency on the regulatory process. I'm happy to go next. So I guess the, the issue I would emphasize would be, uh, so sort of at the outset of the presentation, I mentioned sort of the retrospective analysis and the prospective analysis. And I think um, the federal government and at least some states, I think, have, have done a solid job on the prospective analysis. But I think looking back at the regulations that are currently on the books, I think it's been a challenge, you know, federally, um, you know, when we were at ACUS, we looked at retrospective review initiatives that really go quite far back to the Carter administration, at least. Um, and that really, um, you know, other than the, the reform Chadrow and, and Anthony put in place uh, at OIRA with the regulatory budget has sort of not been um, traditionally uh, part of the agenda on the federal level. And from what we're finding, it really hasn't been at the state level either. Um, so I think that that's really, really important is looking at just not new regulations, but also existing regulations um, and how agencies sort of get a handle on that and ensure that they're they're streamlining regulatory burdens and making sure the existing regulations they have are, are still necessary and are optimized based on current conditions. Yeah, I I uh, I agree with those I agree with those points, and I would say also that I think um sort of to your earlier question, Judge, um you know, what to the extent that um you know some of the changes that were like proposed in A four um they are so they they have a kind of um um they they are sort of presented as technical changes, but they are they are in fact um you know efforts to exercise political control um, and policy direction in the analysis. And I think something that is a little bit, I know Stuart, I've heard you say this publicly before, but I, I think something that is um, 
this, it, there's not as much appreciation for uh, generally is that um, analysis is one key factor that goes into the decision making on a rule and it is not necessarily the controlling or only factor. And so I think that's sometimes the reason there's a lot of fighting over what goes into like how you structure A4, for example, because people think, oh, it, did, did, it decides everything. It does not necessarily decide everything. And I think there's a lot more value in having consistent consistent um, architecture that you can do apples to apples comparisons across the years and decades and all of that, um, rather than you know, uh, just going in and, and changing it wholesale because thinking somehow mistakenly that it 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 is the the determinant on every every policy. Um, so, it, but to the extent that people want to make those kind of changes, I think they should own them politically and say these are these are we are we are exercising political control um, uh, and presidential direction for the for the rulemaking process and just and own it. And I think that gives it a little bit more credibility. I st still is make mean I agree with it, but I think it gives it a little bit more um, legitimacy and then and perspective on what it really is. Yeah, no, well, well put. Um, the uh, the other thing I'd add, and, you know, it's easy to, uh, to dump on Congress, especially this week, um, but, um, you know, we have not, the Clean Air Act hasn't been modified in 30 years, the Clean Water Act, and even longer, and, and plenty of other regulatory statutes sit there. So aside from the lack of regulatory reform, our key regulatory statutes, haven't been looked at in a way that only Congress can look at it. And I think if you, back to your question, the challenges to the regulatory state is in part that, at least at the federal level, and uh, this this is probably less true at the state level, and maybe there's cause for optimism there, um, but that, that Congress has not done what it needs to do in, in, in thinking about these statutes. Um, and there's a whole host of reasons and factors that go into that. Um, but that would be, I think, one of the major challenges to the regulatory state. You're muted, Jedra. Sorry. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists. This was a really interesting, interesting discussion, a lot of different perspectives. And, and thank you to, to our audience uh, for, for tuning in. Thanks. Thank you.